My name is Jeffrey McCutcheon. I'm a professor here at the University of Connecticut. My position is the Northeast Utilities Assistant Professor in Environmental Engineering Education. And what I do here is help develop new types of water technologies to help solve the worldwide water crisis. So there are many sources we have for our water. Primarily, we get our drinking water and industrial water and water for power generation from ground and surface water. The largest water source we have available to us is, of course, the ocean, which constitutes nearly 97% of all water on Earth. Unfortunately, it contains salts, other contaminants, and microorganisms that make it undrinkable to us. There are technologies that are available for making seawater into drinking water, and we call these desalination technologies. These include the evaporation of water uh, from distillation, or we can use more complex systems such as membrane technology to remove the salt from water and make it drinkable. Primarily, we work in areas of membrane separations. Membranes are polymeric materials that can moderate the permeation of chemical species that are in contact with them. They will allow certain things to go through them and they will reject other things. In the case of water filtration, water can pass through membranes while dissolved and suspended contaminants such as salts, bacteria, viruses, organics are rejected from the membrane. In reverse osmosis, a high pressure pump is used to force water through a membrane. The high pressure allows the water to move through the membrane, but the membrane has a small enough pore size to reject and retain the dissolved contaminants. And so what comes through the membrane is clean water, while what is rejected becomes what we call a brine or concentrate. This, in this case, we have a full-scale system, which as you can see here, are in the form of spiral-wound elements. Inside these elements are spiral-wound membranes. The membranes are actually rolled up to allow us to fit more membrane into a smaller volume. This gives us more membrane area and more production capacity and treatment capacity. The membrane itself is actually a very unique structure. It's not just like a simple piece of paper that you might see when you look at them, but instead they're tiered structures, multiple layers. As you can see behind me, there are actually three layers in a typical reverse osmosis membrane. The top layer is made of a very dense, non-porous polymer called polyamid. This particular polymer has the ability to separate salt from water. However, the layers below that layer are actually just open porous structures that do no separation whatsoever. All they do is provide mechanical support for the exceedingly fragile thin selective layer of polyamide. This is how all reverse osmosis systems are currently oriented, where these spiral wound elements are incorporated into modules and those modules are loaded onto racks and these racks are, are placed one on top of the other allowing us to incorporate millions and millions of square meters of membrane area into a very, very small space. While the system that I previously showed you could produce perhaps on the order of one liter per hour, the system here can produce more on the order of two gallons per minute. One of the problems with reverse osmosis and nanofiltration is the requirement that they use very large expensive pumps and these pumps require a large amounts of electrical energy. Electrical energy is a very expensive form of energy and has a large carbon footprint associated with it. So while reverse osmosis is capable of making pure water, it does so at a very high cost. And so alternative technologies have been developed to try to reduce the cost of purifying water. One of those technologies is called forward osmosis. Forward osmosis operates by drawing water across a membrane via osmosis. And osmosis works because of a desire to dilute a very concentrated solution. A concentrated solution called a draw solution has a very high osmotic pressure. And this osmotic pressure draws the water across the membrane. The membrane acts as a barrier to reject any of the dissolved contaminants as well as bacteria and viruses. And this dilutes the draw solution. In the case that we show you here, you'll notice that the water in the tank is blue, but the water coming out is not, is clear. So what you're left with is a diluted form of Gatorade. So you can drink it as a nutritious drink and replenish electrolytes. This has application to not only campers and hikers, but also disaster relief, refugee camps, and areas of the world where 
water, nutrients, and even sugar need to be delivered to fight and combat malnutrition as well as diarrheal disease. So the water crisis to some may seem too big of a problem for any one technology to handle. Therefore, it is very important that we have many tools in our toolbox to combat this problem. A technology that would effectively treat seawater may not be as effective at treating wastewater. A technology that treats wastewater may not be as effective for treating drinking water. So we need a suite of technologies to combat this problem. In the developing world, it is even more challenging. Where the problems aren't necessarily technological, they're more along the lines of implementation. That the technologies that we implement must be appropriate, not only for the society, but also for their maintenance and continued operation. So membranes may play a role in all of this. And I believe that membranes will play an increasingly large role in water treatment and water production around the world, especially as humanity begins to rely more on the ocean for its water supply than ever before.